Now, the artist was trying to make some kind of a statement. I'm not sure what, but <laughs> that's the way it is today. Some of the artwork that's bringing a tremendous amount of money it is not art that you would traditionally think of as being really, you know, the traditional type art. So you have to keep really up with that. And I'm glad I don't, that's not my field because that's tough. You know? <laughs> but building on that, also, as the, as the newscaster said, that painting now has become part of art history. So that's why the value has escalated. And many times people tell me, I had a situation today. I have a piece of art. My, my mother-in-law is an artist. She's really, she's listed. Well, what does that mean? You know, she's listed. So you can get listed in Davenport's or one of the art listing guides by submitting your name, your information. Or uh, a lot of people will come to me and say, I'm an artist and I have a painting in the White House collection. Here's my letter to prove it. Well, they learned that in art school. You send your painting to the White House, you get a letter back thanking you for your addition to the White House collection, and now you have that piece of paper that you're in the White House collection. That doesn't mean value through auction. You know, when, it, when an artist has value, that means they're selling frequently, coming through auction, they've established a market, and now they've, you know, the, the modernist art has become part of the billionaires club, the Chinese, and get involved, the Japanese, you know, and all our philanthropic causes get involved in investing in this blue, new blue chip art. And that's what drives back, is when items are sold and sold with frequency versus you can be a great artist, but have never gone to market, there's no value set. It's now all subjective. See, I found a little tip already. I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna draw something on my center point. <laughs> <laughs> gotta figure it out now. So, everything's upside down. It doesn't make sense anymore. And does anybody know what these figures are? You know what they're made out of? Okay, so, uh, we'll, we'll take the word ceramic. The third and other words are China, ceramic, porcelain. Anybody have any idea who might have made that? Just give me a guess. Who makes who makes figures out of porcelain? Yes. Royal dolls. Bingo. If I were giving out a prize, you would get a prize tonight. And if I find one, I'll give it to you. Royal Dalton used to have one here somewhere. Yes. 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 Royal Dalton made a lot of figures. Uh, they made the dancing ladies and uh, Toby mugs and things of that nature. Well, in the marketplace, they're not very valuable anymore. Right, Brett? They are down. And I bet if you go to auction like at Oliver's, and if they, somebody gave them a collection of 100 of them, guess what? They'll probably sell them in groups of 10, 20, 3 to 5. But it's a commodity. Man. They'll, they'll sell them in groups rather than individually because their value has dropped so much. So the world is kind of upside down. Now, the way things used to be, this is your education for the evening. We're in the library, so we have to do a little bit of education. It used to be that old was good and that very old was better. But if it was very, very old, that was the best. And in terms of antiques and value, people always thought of something, if it was older, it's better and it's more valuable. Please erase that from your memory. Hit the delete button, because that is not true anymore. Age has so little to do with value uh, in today's marketplace. Something can be 10 years old and it's really, really hot. Something can be 200 years old, and the market says, who cares? We don't care. So make sure you understand that. As I get older, my wife tells me I'm worth less. Yes. <laughs> and as I get older, I know I'm worth less. <laughs> so uh, the way things in the past were, an antique used to be something that was 100 years old. That was kind of the definition we used to use. And a collectible was something not 100 years old, less than 100 years. And if it were used, it would just be like 25 or 30 years old. That's the way we used to talk. We don't talk that way now. As a matter of fact, we very seldom use the word antique or collectible, to tell you the truth. Instead, we use words like period, style, maker, vintage, importance, the look. Those are the words we use to signify importance. We don't use the word age. So for this example, we've got, this looks like a, I'm not sure, that looks like a Schwinn 
It's almost like a Schwinn banana float point, right? And if it is, it's more valuable than all the crocs and jugs on the left side right there. And it's not nearly as old, but it's much more valuable. And I said, you know, antiques do not always go up. Again, they go down. So I'm going to pick five things that have, I think have gone down, and Brent will see whether or not he agrees with it. The first thing is what we call brown furniture. Now, brown furniture is furniture like this. It has a brown color. Usually that means mahogany, walnut, a dark color wood. And we often think of brown furniture as being, having a traditional look to it. So this piece, for example, is probably a 1940s Drexel uh, curio cabinet. Not much interest in the marketplace for something like that. Maybe a couple hundred dollars, right? On a good day. And even if that were a real piece, and when I say a real piece, if that were 200 years old, an original period piece, still probably not going to get a lot of money, right? And in fact, when, when a piece like that, if it was, if it would have a maker name, we're finding with the brown furniture, Kittinger, Henrodine, uh, Baker, those value, those names are more searchable now by the next generation, and the, the quality is, people recognize the quality by those names. So rather than buying one that's period, and then trying to figure out, are the pools replaced, is it refinished, you know, has it been messed with at all, people are, people want to say, okay, Baker, Kittinger, Henrodon, you know, that kind of thing. Um, be able to buy it from brand recognition. Round oak table, you know what a round oak table is, right? They once used to be real hot. Have you sold a round oak table for over seven or eight hundred dollars in the last five years? Not even close. Right. You can't give a couple yeah. hundred. They're, they're used furniture now. That's right. So and and the 1970 Bennington Pine look, you might as well dump that. So, no, I know what you do, you paint it white. Yeah. <laughs> These people love white right now. So number one, brown furniture gone down. Number two, I'm going to say Victorian stuff. Victorian is the foo-foo stuff, the 19th century, the fine, the parlor sets, and the fancy glass, and uh, the silver that you put your olives and pickles in, and everything has uh, a place. That, at one time, that was pretty strong, and there were collectors of all of that. I'd say that was very soft right now, because people do not decorate with it. Number one, it's uncomfortable. You can't watch football laying on a Victorian sofa. <laughs> and who wants an apron like this, which just sits there? You know, what good is it going to do? The dog or cat's going to knock it off the table. And you have to dust it. You're right. So number two is Victorian. Number three, now I put records down, but I only mean that tongue in cheek. I mean records that look like this, that look like this. You know, the, the piles of old records that are classical music or popular music, you know, like Montavani Strings and, you know, Moonlight River and all that stuff, or even 78 RPMs from 1910 to 1930, uh, classical music, etc. Nobody seems to care too much about them. Uh, and they want you to break the record. Literally, they want you to break the record and throw it away. <laughs> However, I think we could also put the records in the, the escalating ones too. On the other side, if we're talking about rock and roll, early jazz, there are certain categories that are really, really hot. But there, it's not all for the music. Dust jacket is extremely important. It's the graphics on the dust jacket and the, and the uh, condition of the dust jacket. So, so if you have a pile of old records home, probably not worth anything. But if you've got some old, uh, you know, Bob Dylan, Beatles and Elvis, okay, particularly if the covers are nice, you might have something. Next, cut glass. You know what cut glass is? It's a fancy glass, again, it's the end of the Victorian period. It's from about 1900 to 1930, and uh, it can be colored, it can be, this is, most of this is what I call brilliant cut glass here. It's very, very nice, very thick, there's a lot of hand craftsmanship, someone had actually cut those designs in there, who cares, right? Few few exceptions. Webb, few exceptions. Yeah, right? Webb, Libby, um, there's a few, few um, 
sign pieces that would be the exception to the rule. Right. And as soon as we give a, a to our salespeople, we tell them that there's, you know, these things are, are down, they're, you know, then we have something that's spiked, you know, and, uh, you know, there's always something to prove you wrong. Now, by the way, does anyone know if there's where the signature is on a signed piece of cut glass? Right, you want to tell us? Generally, right in the middle. Uh, you'll see it'll be in acid, rake the light oil across it, and you'll be able to see that, that name. Is uh, very difficult? Uh, uh, it, it, it could be under or in the middle, one or the other, like on a piece of stemware, yeah. like Waterford glass, it's usually on the very bottom. Waterford background is on the bottom, and that's acid, but Libby is actually a, uh, a little, and Hawks, Libby, Hawks, uh, Webb, uh, they're going to be generally on the So you've got, you've got to look at it at an angle and see if there's anything there, and it could be good. But generally, if you have a whole china closet full of cut glass, and it's generic cut glass, good luck. Great luck. Yep, <laughs> good luck. And what I come here is anything sold as a collectible usually isn't. <laughs> uh, again, any of the limited that's what I'm talking on top, these are precious moments, they're bubbles, uh, Barbie dolls, unless it's the 1959, forget it. Uh, baseball cards, sport cards, if they're from the 90s, forget it. They've got to be Mickey Mantle in the 50s and 60s or earlier. So generally the collectible field is rough. A, a humble doll like this that at one time could have sold for between sixty and hundred dollars is now not going to sell by itself, right? I usually figure if I'm doing an appraisal for an estate, I figure appraises at five to seven dollars a piece. Yeah. Holy crap, right? <laughs> <laughs> Think about a lot of this has become a hummel, hummel figurine, especially you know they were call them, you know, they were souvenirs, they were trade symbolized, they were coming back with the soldiers. Then they came into our uh, Hallmark store type stores by through authorized dealers. You had to go to this jeweler or that jeweler to get your, and then what comes along? You bet. So now it's a commodity. So why would I pay an absorbent price for that unless when there's 20, every 20 minutes there's an auction closing that has humbles in it online. So I'll wait and get the one I want. And there's, again, there's exceptions to every rule, but you know, it, you know, typically, um, you know, they're not a whole lot of money anymore. Okay, so there are my five, and now I guess on Brett's uh, that five that have gone up. So we'll, we'll see here. So things that have gone up or surprised us. So we're seeing a huge, and, and this week is for all of us. We have three days that we're selling uh, firearms and military. Um, so firearms, uh, typically a um, small bore, uh, small bore, small caliber uh, tend to go up. With a lot of the 22s have become very collectible. Uh, small gauge shotguns, 28 gauge, 410 gauge shotguns, especially your over-unders, is uh, your higher grades. Some shotguns are, are artistry in themselves with engraving and gold inlay and nickel inlay. They're phenomenal. Uh, military items. Um, the military firearms are probably the fastest growing as far as in value. And then uh, military items, except in military there's a lot of fakes, especially when you get into the, the early World War I, World War II. But now we're getting to the Vietnam era war, we're getting into Desert Storm, Iraq, you know. Again, it's all that history and it's all pertaining to the group that's buying it as well. So, if you were in your 50s, you might be buying Desert Storm, you know, and versus, you know, Vietnam, you know, or 40s being buying into some of these other. It's all generational. And, and some of the military stuff, it's, it's more valuable being from this century or Vietnam than it would be from the Revolutionary War sometimes, yeah, absolutely. believe it or not. <laughs> other category. Musical instruments. Um, we've seen a huge rise, and again, I'm, when I look at the things that are on the rise, there are things that transcend generations. You know, when we talk about music, whether you're into classical or classic rock, a guitar still transcends. You know, um, a violin, violin, a fiddle, electric, you know, whatever it may be, it, it, they're all transcending. But again, it, it all goes to quality and, and the rarity of those items. Um, you know, again, a a Mexican guitar that was a you know hundred dollar guitar is probably never going to be a thousand dollar guitar. A 
a good Martin, a good Gibson, like gold. I mean, they're moving. I can't even use gold as an example, because that's been way for me. So, uh, but yeah, uh, violin market. Again, things that I look at when we look at uh, markets are also what trades internationally. So, you know, whether you talk about the military items or you talk about the musical instruments, all trade internationally. A Hummel, who cares? You know, a Beanie Baby, who cares? You know, as far as internationally, you know, if you talk about, you know, something like this, you know, or cut glass, it's not such a big deal because there's so much other out there. And the next one, number three. So, um, jewelry and wristwatches. When we say jewelry, um, jewelry, I think, uh, the, the caveat I have there is um, looking for designer pieces. Everything, you know, when you talk about what are the buzzwords that add value to anything, you talked about in furniture, designer, you know, manufacturer. Um, in jewelry, you know, if you have Van Cleef and Arpels or Caldwell or um, any of the, the big Chanel, any of the big names that have backed uh, jewelry making, those are the pieces that are that are skyrocketing again, and an international market is a big part of that push. Um, Wristwatches. Um, I think you know when I travel, oftentimes I'll ask people on a, on a plane or whatever when they find out you're an auctioneer. Oh, that's cool. What do you sell? What do you collect? You know, and, and it's one of those things that people have to think a little bit. And oftentimes, I, I will get the the answer from young men: wristwatches. Um, again, it's, you know, we have some of that, uh, but there's a lot of different, whether it's by maker uh, or whether it's a complicated dial like a chronograph or um, something that has a um, repeater uh, is another uh, classic uh, that is collected, but uh, watches are, are very collectible. And again, not old, uh, the vintage uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, we're finding a lot of it. Customer just showed me this week in Jules Jurgensen, which wasn't ever a huge high dollar watch, but it was a fascinating, um, you know, multi dollar complicated movement, and it was a two thousand dollar watch. I never thought I'd sell handbags, <laughs> but handbags is one of those things I can sell, and and you can't count fast enough. Um, when you're selling Louis Vuitton, Chanel, Hermes. Um, you know, again, I'm not, you know, we get into some of the lower Michael Kors and Coach and things like that, but, you know, when you get into the, we have a whole section coming up in our December option that's all high-end Italian and, and French handbags. Um, you know, it's, again, I, I, I think these are things that are, are outward expressions of, of who we are. We can collect them, we can use them. Um, I'm a watch guy. Um, a lot of people that I know are always like, what are you wearing today? You know, and, and it's just kind of like checking checking out what you have. I think for ladies it's the same thing. Handbags, um, it's an item they can use and get the enjoyment out. Because we're not socializing like we used to. I remember going to people's house for Sunday afternoon dinner and you, you'd sit there and they'd show you what they bought at auction on Saturday. You know, because they were looking for that piece of cut glass, or they were looking for that piece of pattern glass, or that hum 1971 Hummel plate, back in the 80s was bringing a thousand bucks. Today, you can't get $50 for it. But it was all about supply and demand for the first year they made it, and everybody wanted it. And who would have thought 20 years ago you'd be selling this handbags? Exactly. <laughs> we used to, back when I did, we used to sell a whole house, and we wouldn't even look in the closet. That would all go to the trash. No, no way could be anything worth anything in there. This is probably the hottest commodity and probably one of the biggest buzzwords, mid-century. Mid-century is on anything. Uh, again, you know, the style of it is, is one thing, but the first thing we ask is, you know, who is the designer, the manufacturer? And usually, um, you have a manufacturer like Knoll, but then you would have a designer that was designing for Noel, like Harry Bertoyev. Um, you know, so he would do the design, Noel would be the manufacturer. So you have two very good names that have carried over generations for quality and usefulness. Top left there is a, uh, and the bottom bench is a gentleman that was working out of New Hope, George Nakashima. Um, we are now selling 
craftsman that worked and apprenticed under him and worked in his style, and that's doing very well also. Not as well as Nakashima, but it's into the thousands versus tens of thousands. So there are the five. So, what do you have to know? <laughs> so, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to go through what you have here. Now, I devised a little tool to help us out tonight. And so I want to explain the tool. I, I haven't shown Brent, so I have to explain to him as well. So we're going to do two things. We're going to look at an item, and we're going to say, OK, what does the market say? Is that hot? Is it warm? Is it cool? Or is it cold? And so just like we've done with these items there, we'll be able to tell you, well, listen, nobody wants it. But rather than say that, we're going to say, well, the market's really cool. Right? And, and if nobody really wants it, you want to throw it away, we're going to say the market's cold. So we'll be nice about it. Then we're going to turn it over. And rather than give you a specific price, because in real, when we do an appraisal, we like to spend more time, we've got to look at it, we've got to research it, but we can't possibly do that in this short amount of time. So we're going to kind of give you a rate, we're going to give you a star. Okay, so a one star means that it's $50 or less. A two star means it's 50 to 200. Three star is 200 to 500. Four star is 500 to 2,000. And a five star means whoopee do, you can go home and plan your new car. Right? So, now if you want more information, we're always available to do that. But that's our day job. Okay? So we do that on a regular basis, and you'd have to call us up, and you'd have to pay such a high price for our services. But because we're at the library, and we're, you know, everything is you know, donated, and this is a good cause, your time is our time. But we're just going to give you this. So, but if you need more information, you can take our card, our business cards, and give us a call later on. We'll be more than happy to help you. Um, now, I wanted to just share one thing with you in terms of uh, research, because a lot of this stuff doesn't come out of our head. I mean, even though it appears like we're both pretty knowledgeable guys, uh, a lot of this stuff we actually look up because we do have computers and we have research data and search. Basis. The one I like to use a lot for what I do is called liveauctioneers.com. So it's L-I-V-E auctioneers.com. And the reason I like it, it's free. I like that. And uh, you know, it's not subscription-based, so you can all get on that as well. And if you type in the right uh, description, then all the auctioneers that use live auctioneers, live auctioneers use for auctions, they, they put their auctions online. And so if they do it on live auctioneers, they capture that information when the items are sold, and they keep them there as records. So you can look things up. So all of hers has some of their results. So, so you would look on your price results for things that if you're looking for a value, you can also use it if you're looking to collect something. So if you collect fountain pens, you can put in Mont Blanc fountain pen, and it'll show you all the options coming up that have Mont Blanc fountain pens. If you want to find out what your is worth or a value range, that's a good way. And I like what you're saying because it is it, it's true values. There's certain things that you know if you're selling a European painting, it may have if you look at all the options that it sold and they were all in Europe, and now yours is in the U.S. Well. You know, what do I have? Is it worth shipping abroad or do I sell it here locally? A couple other things, since Leon's making you um, honorary appraisers, the, the other thing that I would say as far as tools to look at, when we look at an item, we look at how many, how many markets will it appeal to? Is it, does it have crossover markets? So for instance, if it is an advertising sign and it has, um, I don't know, uh, advertising sign and it has a car on it and maybe it has a dog in it and it has Ford. So there you're looking at it from the, the standpoint of I have advertising, I have an automobile, I have a Ford collector, maybe it's enamel uh, the way it's made. So I have enamel sign collectors. You're looking at all those crossover markets that people would want to bid on that item. Um, and, and that's, that's a plus, um, so we call it add value. So that checks more boxes as you go. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to attempt this and see how this works. 
So Frank, you just pick an item here. Well, why don't we start off with here? Oh, we're starting off with something that really shouldn't go on this, but we'll do it anyway. Uh, that's a good one to go on there. So here we have uh, an alms box. Uh, again, one of the things we look at is construction. So we want to look at it. I can hold it up so you can see it in the back. It's two parts. It's wood construction, and then the decoration is done in gesso. Uh, so it's a multi-layer process uh, to create that three-dimensional uh, uh, carving and, and gesso to highlight those pieces. And you can see some of the gesso showing through on some of that. But when you look at um, something of age, uh, we look at, you know, prove how old it is to me, okay? If I'm looking at this and I'm seeing modern uh, nails in it that are wire nails, um, it's not going to uh, ring true to what it should be. Um, but you're looking at condition, uh, you're looking at the construction. The only thing that I see that is, you know, it has a few bumps and, and dings, and you would too if you were this old. Uh, we're missing a lock. So it didn't have a lock, um, and it probably would have had hinges here, um, and they would have been a, what we call a cotter pin type. Um, you know what a cotter pin looks like, and uh, two pins, at one in the base, one in the lid, that would have created that hinge uh, look. Again, looking at this, um, you know, again, I would have um, hit, the, hit the computer, and interestingly enough, well, what would you think about the marketplace? So we have a religious item. So sometimes that's good, sometimes not. Yeah. Uh, I, as a whole, I think you might agree with me. Religious items are kind of yeah. down at the cool level. People generally don't want to buy religious items, right? Correct. Right. Except when you get something that has considerable age. You might have an icon from Russia or from Greece or something of this nature, or something really that is ecclesiastical, I mean, there's really a limited amount of those, then I think that kind of, that all of a sudden, the temperature rises on something like that, right? Correct, okay, good. And I think also you, you need to look at here again, is um, what is the form? Um, you know, the form is interesting, you know, and, and, that, and it's easily transported. It's not something that commands the, the, a whole room. Uh, for me to display this, I can have it, it's, and it can easily travel with me. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, it's not a, a marble statue or something. And by the way, you know what an alms box is for? It's in a church. You would put money for the poor uh, when on your way out. You would drop in your coins on the floor. Now, the interesting thing is, if you look at the scene on it, they're obviously religious scenes, and I think it's Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus, which is interesting. So it's symbolic, it means if you put a coin in here, you are raising the status of poor people, like coming to life. So I, I, I like that, I like that little symbolism, and I like the fact that, uh, well, I tend to like religious objects anyway, but, I mean, this is, this is all, we're talking something that's, uh, that could be 400 years old. That's, okay, so now we're getting into something that really is old. Not, we don't just say it's old, it really is old. Um, and you went, uh, you went on Sotheby's, right? Sotheby's London site. Sotheby's London site and found it, because he wanted, he was gonna check and see whether or not we knew what we are talking about, right? So he, so he went on, he found it, a sale that looked very similar, if not identical. It was like $8,000, right? So, when he brought it, I went on live auctioneers and I did it. There was 137 results of alms boxes, not just like this, but anything that's called an alms box. And we found the exact same one there that was sold here in America in 2004, 14 years ago, for $750. So what we do as appraisers, we have a $750 result and we have an $8,000 result. So we're kind of setting our parameters here. Now we want to do a little more research and see if we can find more sales because that's going to probably narrow that down a bit. And we got to go look at the Sotheby's result and see what they said about theirs that made it bring $8,000. Maybe a Pope owned it or something. And that, that is a very valid point. We're selling a bishop out of Scranton, his home, and he was a very notable bishop in Scranton. And when we sold his things, a lot of religious items, and 
you know, people were buying them because they belonged to, you know, a bishop. And so that was their draw to that. Right. So we've got, we give that one five stars. Okay, five stars. And we, and very, very, very now we're not going to spend all this time on everybody else's items like that, but it's a good one to start. You got another one there, Brad? Let's, uh, well, let me just go to Silver. Okay. So today, oftentimes when we get into a house, the question is, that we ask is, do you have any silver? So we want to know, do you have sterling silver flatware? Okay, so here we have a set. Um, I need my, yes. my help glasses. Oh, my glasses don't, don't do enough anymore. So here we have Steve. Steve uh, is the manufacturer, uh, which that would help me to be able to look up the pattern, which it's a, uh, Sort of a diamond cut floral pattern. It is monogram. Uh, so monogram is going to be a few ticks off for a collector. It's going to be one of these. See, I, have, I have a sterling silver pattern book. So I look under Steve and Company and I have patterns there and I can find the name of that particular pattern. So it would probably take two minutes. So to do a to do a catalog description or a, an appraisal, we would agree by getting with that, that pattern name. And then we can look at so are there collectors for the pat this pattern? Are there a piece in demand? As a whole, Steve is, is one of the better silver manufacturers um, that we look at. You know, again, you, you think you know the name Tiffany and um, Gorham and, and those other uh, companies that would have the desirability. Another one that's widely um, collected is George Jensen. Um, and that, you know, again, very valuable. Yeah, on the scale, George Jensen would be up here, Tiffany would be up here, Steve, I would probably put it yeah. in here. Steve also made a, it was Kirk, Kirk, uh, Steve, but there was the Kirk Company and the Steve Company, and it was Kirk Steve Company. They made a pattern called Ray Bose. The Ray Bose is pretty popular. That, that is very popular. That would be so dope. floral, three-dimensional, uh, you know, the, right. a knife is decorated all the way around. Uh, a lot heavier in weight. So that's another thing we look at is weight. Okay, so uh, oftentimes people say, oh no, we don't have the silver, we scrapped it. Okay, but I look at silver and say, there's other contributing factors to value, and that is utilitarian, manufacturer, pattern name, weight, those are all parts of the equation. So if I'm taking this to a melter to scrap it and getting my $14 an ounce, that's only a mathematical equation. Where as, as looking at auction, I look at what is the collectability of this pattern. Um, so that's where, it, and also completeness of set is another thing to look at. So we're going to put it right in here. Oh, I can right in the middle. Now most silver, by the way, I would put down as being cool for silver. It's usually sold for its weight. Right, correct? I would not say that. I would argue that back. It's, it's more now? I, I think that people are looking at Sorry. it okay. a little differently. Um, Good. That they're, good they're, that they're collecting. Let me rephrase that. Oh, silver plate is down here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> silver plate is all the work, but there's no value. There's no, no intrinsic metal to it. So if we were going to do a, a star on this, I'm going to guess we're in the one, two, we're in the four star. Lower four star, 500 to 2,000, okay. think. Yep. Depends on how many pieces. But uh, if a fork, for example, a fork, you have a, you have a uh, salad fork, a dinner fork, you have a, a teaspoon, and then a dinner knife. And it looks like we have maybe a few butter knives. So it looks like we like $10 to $20 for each one of the pieces, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. okay. okay, so that's how it kind of breaks And the reason he says except for the knives, Now some are also, but now that the handle is usually weighted, so it's got cement or sand or plaster in it, so actually the silver is just a coating on the outside. So most people don't have the white knives in terms of silver content. That's where oftentimes if you see it, it'll say silver reinforced or um, silver weighted. Oftentimes uh, many candlesticks are going to be silver reinforced so they don't tip over. Now, I'm going to pick this up while the kids are right. And frankly, you've kind of got a stump on these. 
Okay. Now, what's stumping me? See, I thought this. I thought this. I really, really was thought I was very brilliant. I thought this was a holy water fountain, a font, because it looks like a faucet up here, right? And it's got a basin right there, and so you put it in your house, like right there, and when you go in and out, you use it as holy water and bless yourself. The only problem is that it has a huge hole. <laughs> so it's not going to hold. That story doesn't hold water. And the second thing is, there's an electric outlet right up here. I don't think I want to dip my hand in electric and turn turn the switch on. So we, we come. We, now we've decided that it's probably a wall sconce, a pair of Does wall Does anybody sconce. know who, who brought these in? Are they out of a theater or something that you would hold in car sconce? Oh, oh, so you would hang your hang your purse or something on there? Yeah. You would hold it. Cool. Ah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Now, if you hadn't said that, <laughs> really, if you hadn't said that, I would have put that down here. Okay? And I would have said, you're lucky to get one star out of those. Because who cares? The but fact that you said Pullman, you yeah. said Pullman, now all of a sudden, now we're talking about train collectibles. But now look at something else, look at the decoration, Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau. So we've gone from here, now we're up to like here. Okay? Now they're not working, and they don't say if they were signed with a railroad company like. Uh, a little more Ohio, yeah, Pennsylvania Railroad. Then we would like be that. up a little higher. So we're right in here. I would still, however, I'd probably go to maybe two stars, 50 to 200 for the pair. I, we might be generous with that. But it, but we're also taking your word for it. <laughs> now, now, I'm not saying you're wrong, but what we, want is, what we would like to see is proof. We would like to see a picture somewhere where they're actually in a car, and that's the exact same one. Then we go, okay, we can take your word for it 100%. And then someone will restore them, and then it'll be real. Good. But again, I, I test oftentimes when people bring things to me, I say, well, our job is to you know, make the piece tell us that that's what it could be. Because again, when you go to the font, it wasn't functional. It couldn't be. When you say, you know, Pullman car, it all makes sense, you know, because, and that's what we were talking about. Is it a coat hook? Is it a handbag hook? Or what is the purpose for it? So it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Sure, now, this is obviously a stein, right? But the first thing I notice here, it doesn't have a top. They usually have pewter lids on it. Instead, we have the remnant. We have the holder, the clasp for it. So the problem is it's empty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so just on that alone, the fact that it doesn't have a top, the fact that it's empty. But if I look at the bottom, and it says, uh, it's just, it says Germany with a number on it. I'm going to, without any further, anything else, I'm going to say, okay, we're down here, we're in that cold, cool area, and we're, once, we're under $50. The damage, the condition is really important, it's not complete. So that kind of puts, you know, puts it away. I have one in my home that does not have a top, and it used to have a lid on it, but it's of a, a gnome. And the gnome is fixing a clock, and it's a uh, Metlock Stein, which is made in Germany. They're better stuff. Metlock were like the, the key name in Stein making. So even without the top, it's just really magnificently done, and the scene is beautiful. It's almost like a piece of art. So that makes a difference, whereas this is more common. Um, even if this were all together, we're probably not, it's going to be hard to get that above 50 to one star. The other thing with steins is many of them, uh, you want to look through them at the light. Some have a lithophane at the bottom, so they'll have a decoration. Uh, especially the regimental steins will have them. But again, the regimental steins, a lot of reproductions involved there. But when you hold it up to the light, you'll see that uh, silhouette or a picture. It's called a lithophane. It's usually a new lady. So that when you finish drinking, you know it's time to go home. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Yeah. 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 Do you have one like that? Now they can be worth more. The lithophanes can be worth more. The regimentals were actually given out to the members of the regiment. And so they usually have their names on it in a uh, military scene. But as Brent said, most of them are reproductions. They make them today. But this lady links at the one. She I'm <laughs> much more. Is that after?
happened two or three times. And ladies winking at me here. So here we have, a, with this piece, a little gypsy kettle, a uh, little cauldron, and it's interesting, it has a keychain to it. Now, what's more interesting is the person, when she brought it in, we said, so tell us the story about this. She said, well, she was kayaking on the Schuylkill, and the water was real clear. On the Schuylkill, imagine that. <laughs> so it was real clear. She could see it, and she reached down and pulled it out. So evidently, it was something that she was wondering if anybody lost one, uh, you know, <laughs> in these storms. But again, in looking at this or, or feeling it, the first thing that comes to mind is it's light, okay? So it's cast aluminum, not cast iron. Okay, an old one would be cast iron. Uh, so this is cast aluminum. Uh, again, the story is worth you know 50 bucks. Uh, yeah, I, would, I would say the itself. Generally, we're down in the cold, cool water here of the school yeah. down at the bottom, and the value is probably only one star. However, there's a story here somewhere because the, the key it appears to be an old key. And it is a real large key. Now, why did she have? Why did someone put a key on that? That makes no sense to me. I think so. I think there's got to be a story there, you know. And uh, if we could figure out the story, it would raise the value a little bit there. But that's why we're in a library. You can make up a story. That would be a good story. Raise the whole novel around that. You know, finding this in a school book. Now, let me just. Let me do this before we get to that menu. Now, it's a vase, right? A triple vase, and it's some kind of a, a greenish amber colored stone, right? So I'm going to say, I'm going to guess here, I'm, I'm going to say probably in this area, just below more, more in the cool area. And I'm going to say, depending on the condition, that it's probably somewhere between one and two. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm hedging a little bit here. Okay, now, and if I'm wrong, you're going to tell me why I'm wrong. So what we have here is called soapstone, um, and again, uh, Chinese carved uh, vase. Um, oftentimes came in various forms. Vase is probably the most common form that you see. Size is a big contributor to value. Uh, oftentimes different colors, uh, but this is pretty much you, you'll see a lot of these reddish browns. Uh, that, that come out. Um, condition is good. We have uh, birds in here and some uh, chrysanthemums. Uh, oftentimes, wood will add more value is if you have monkeys or a dragon, something a little bit more, uh, you know, intriguing than, than the birds and the carving. Um, and I would say, in the current market, I would give it probably a one star. Okay. So we're, we're pretty much in agreement on that. It's not as valuable as most people think. I would say. It's not, it's not all that rare, you know, it, yeah. and, and then the other part is, who cares? Yes. I mean, it, it really, what it comes down to is, you know, what, what does somebody want to do with it? You know, is this going to appeal to the next generation of life? And, it, and these were like import souvenirs. So the people from China and Asia that are collecting their items, they, they want their heritage back, they don't really care about this. Okay, next is something I don't know anything about. <laughs> E-X-L-I-B-R-I-S. 
my version of that, xlibris.com. And it lists, it's a, a basically a compilation of booksellers around the world. And if you type in the title, if that book is for sale anywhere in the world, that should come up. And it will give you description in terms of the printing. It will tell you whether it's a first edition, what size it is, how many pages were in that edition, etc. And that's really helpful. And then you can say, okay, they're asking, I see ones here for 500, ones for 750. Uh, there, they tend to be clustered on that range, then you know that's what you're talking about right there. Uh, but again, going back to your, your books, so a couple of things that tick boxes is you have first edition, you have children's books, you know, and then you have condition that's amazing. Illustrations are really well done. Uh, this one here, when you have, you know, this is called a clamshell case. So you have the original clamshell case. So if you're on a Libris and, and you are seeing other pieces, you may find that here's a book, but it doesn't have the case. Um, and then you want to look at what is the grade of the book? You know, is it, has the book been dropped? Is it dog-eared? You know, it has, how, you know, hard has it been read? Um, are some other factors that are going to contribute to value? And again, one of the things that I will be quick to say is if I don't know something, I have somebody in our company that does. So I have, we have a specialist in books and stamps and coins and all those things. So when there's things that we get into that aren't into our bailiwick, that's when we call in somebody else who has more knowledge in that field. Like books in general, used books, they're down at this level. And I don't care how old they are. A book could be 200 years old, it's still down on this level. But there are categories that are very, very popular and hot. Children's books and first editions are going to be among the hotter categories, so we know we've got a possible winner here. What I'm going to, su I'm going to suggest something, and it's up to you to take it up. These are so nice that if the library had, some, most libraries have display cases, and I don't know whether, Mark, you have a display case, but usually they put like exhibits in the library. These are worthy of a display case with a little bit of information that some appraiser might be willing to donate his time to offer some, and put that in the display case for like a month or so and let everybody look at it. Because they're, they're nice. They're nice. Thanks for Do you have more? I do. Uh, and you probably need somebody to go to your house. Yeah. <laughs> what in the world is this? Oh, I see. It's like a little machinist, a tap and die cabinet, right? Cool. You've you seen the printer, uh, we call them type trays, uh, is that when you did, uh, like a newspaper would do printing, they'd have type trays. And there were all these little tra drawers and they'd have little compartments on them, but they don't do that anymore because it's all computerized. So people use the type tray and they hang it on a wall, and they put their, all their little miniatures there. And so we call them printers and trays or type trays. They're very popular. Uh, they're not quite as valuable as they once were, but everybody likes them. This, though, I don't think you can hang this on a wall and put stuff in it, but it is sure a nice example of a machinist cabinet, you know, that has that material right in it. So what, what is really neat here is this, this, this box is a commercial set, tap and die set. The box down below is a machinist that made his own box. So he's got in here, he's got little miniature spoke shavers, or uh, they're actually convex. Yes. Um, he's got it fitted out here for a little feeler gauge. And just really some wonderful tools here. Um, and one of, the, one of the other hot commodities right now is industrial. Uh, people are, you know, industrial and steampunk. I was in a restaurant over the weekend that, you know, all the fixtures were made out of uh, recycled copper and, and galvanized piping and gauges and had all types of different fittings in it. And it, was, it was really pretty neat. Uh, it's like a little museum. But this here, I think you have a couple. Again, a couple different things. Um, the question is, you know, should this be sold as a set or would it be sold individually? Um, I would maybe look at this if I was selling it and, and maybe break some of this apart. 
just because the case was made for it, uh, I would say you know there may be a collector that would want you know the planes, uh, or there may be you know somebody that wants some of these other things, or if there's different markings on them, you know if Winchester made um, tools and they're widely collectible, um, so we oftentimes look to see what the names are on some of those things. I would say old tools in general are only cool. You know, it's a they kind of go like this, and I'd say they're general, or just like an old plane, woodblock plane. We don't care too much for that. But you're getting into something specialized now, and custom and unusual, so now you're getting up a little bit. I would think that we are, if we're lucky, you might get three stars, right? Two yeah, I, I think you're probably two stars when you're ready. Yeah. I mean, the type of die set is definitely one star. They're plentiful. Um, you know, they're, they're around. Um, this is where you kind of tip the scales on some of these, with some of the specialty tools. Was that a family piece, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, me. Yeah. Your grandfather. Your so grandfather. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. That he, yeah, nice. I don't have a, um, a workbench okay. that made and of every tool has a location. So the, the machinist toolbox were made out of oak and had multiple drawers and a lift lid. The price on those have gone up because now they're being used as men's and ladies' jewelry boxes. You know, because they were multi-drawer and you know they have a neat industrial look. I'll do this, you can do that. Okay, I'll take the easy one. <laughs> uh, these are um, first aid covers. When you, you know what a first aid cover is, when the stamp is first issued, you would send your self addressed envelope in, and then they would send it to you and stamp it where, from the city where they were uh, originated in, and so they would be first aid covers. Usually, and, and I see loads and loads of first aid covers, usually, you can sell a box full, and I mean a pretty large box full of a lot of albums for under one star. In other words, they're not worth much of anything. Uh, however, these are uh, Norman Rockwell, so it's a scouting through the eyes of uh, Norman Rockwell, and so they're specialized. Unfortunately, I'm still going to say it's only one star. It's not terribly popular because there were so many of these that, that, that came out. However, talking about Norman Rockwell, uh, if you have a Norman Rockwell painting, no. that's in the hot, hot, hot area. And because Norman Rockwell was an illustrator. Now, illustrators painted, but they painted because there were covers of magazines. So their original painting was kind of thrown away or put in the closet. It wasn't meant to hang on somebody's wall because it was meant to be on a cover of the magazine. Well, now we love those things, and uh, so Norman Rocco, you want one of his paintings, and it can be a heck of a lot of money for, for Rocco. But unfortunately, that doesn't translate into first day covers. So the rest of this, that's scout member? The rest of this is all scout member video. So here we have a little, uh, the official uh, headwear of the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, again, rich <coughs> label, no, no mothballs in it, good condition. The rest is, here we have, um, pretty big plate, a little Indian head. Um, I don't know if she's part of the uniform or anybody know? Scarf holders. Scarf holders. Yeah, okay. Because we have a couple of those here as well. Now, the thing with the thing with Boy Scouts, the wide wide group of collectors, but nobody was paying them. We're cheap. Yeah. Boy Scouts are cheap. It's just you know say because I was a Boy Scout. Yeah, a lot of cheap. people, a lot of people want to. Collect it because it's nostalgic and and it's and it's it's out there. It's fun to, to find what you can, but there's not a lot of big dollars that are being thrown at this area. So one star, kind of down here. Yeah. Now was this train? Did someone use this to bring something in, or was something that was great? I brought it. You brought it in for us to look at. It. Okay. It's a metal tray. We call it toll. Toll is a metal tray that's been painted. Um, I would say that this is 20th century. 
number is, it's not earlier than that. And usually when you get into toll, painted toll, you want the earlier pieces that were handmade by a tinker and then painted by an artist. And, and so you'll see handmade features on it and uh, the, the painting is really, sometimes could be crude, but it's more Americana. I would say, no, this is just a commercial tray. I'm going to put it, unfortunately, at the one star, and you're down in the cold area right there. Okay. If it was a period piece of coal, uh, black is was more of a common color. Red is one of most in demand. Yellow and then this is green as well. Uh, but toll wear is all about condition uh, and then form. That was hand painted. That is old. It could be hand painted, but it's not. It's uh, it's hand painted, but it's it's just hand painted. <laughs> It's by no one that we know about, and it's by no one that has a style that's peculiar to them. Can we say that? It's like Grandma Moses didn't do it. So if we knew Grandma Moses did it, now if you told us that it was by so-and-so and they signed it, that might have made a difference. If I had one that was signed, yeah, that would make it. Yes, that would make a difference. But I was going to say also, this, this was also kind of a uh, early, early mid-20th century craft thing that people got into later. They were painting tollware, they were painting China, they were buying blanks of China, they called it granny art, where they would, you know, paint their own decoration. That's very different than if you had a piece from one of the uh, Royal Vienna or Nippon, Nortaki, where they employed artists to come to their, their workshop and paint it, and that's why those pieces are up here. And, you know, a, a blank that somebody painted in their basement so here we have a painting. Whose is this? Do you mind if I pass it around? Okay. So I want you to look at this, and as you look at it, um, so at first blush it looks like a painting. It's not. Okay. It's what we call a gicle. So it is a a gicle is a very common uh, form, common practice. What they do is they it's. We know what decoupage is. They take a, a decoupage and uh, put that onto a board, and then they put varnish over top of it, and they put brushwork in that varnish. So it looks like it's painted. Um, there's many different forms you can buy, or you can. They're available out there. Are are prints that people hand color. Um, there's oil paintings that are printed on canvas, and this is not a new form that has. It's been around for. 200 years um, that you can find these paintings, but oftentimes if you have a, a sheet clay or a painted print, they won't touch areas of face, hands, things of detail. They're gonna they're gonna paint, put some red brush marks on the coat, or they're gonna put a little you know dash here on the mirror frame or something a shiny object that is gonna catch your eye and you're gonna see that three dimensional quality to it. And uh, you know a lot of them come in from, you know, different countries, but they're also prevalent, you know, in 20th century. So um, what, so what Brett's saying is that we're really down in cold area on this one, and it's probably a one star. It's all decorative. It's all decorative. And you told me what you paid for it, so, uh, you know, so you, you did okay. Right. You're fine. Even modern artists today will do G clays, and now to be really tricky is they do the G clay, uh, and then after it's done, they'll do it. They'll take the brush and they'll hand embellish the G clay. So when you look at it, you're saying, "Well, gee, it was hand painted. I can see the brush strokes on it." And they'll try to sell that for an additional premium because the artist came along and did that, put their touch on it. So, yeah, it's unfortunate. Oh, King of Prussia, three miles. Uh, this sign is not terribly old. I mean, I'm thinking because of the pine on the back, uh, probably 1940s or 50s or 60s, something like that. Something like that. Um, usually, street signs, advertising signs, they actually are pretty popular, pretty, I'd say they're at least in the middle here. If they're really specific and wonderful condition, they're going to get up there a little bit. But it's, uh, it's just black and white. There's no graphics on it. It's, uh, 
It has a little bit of age. I suppose if you live around King of Prussia, like we do here, it has more interest than somebody who lives in Montana. But not, ex I, I would say, we're still in the one star range for this. Okay. But if there were graphics, and if it were, this is an area where older is better. So if you have an older sign that has a lot of wear on it, and patina, then it's going to be worth more money. Particularly if it's a, not just a street sign, but it could be an old store sign. You know, if it said Phoenix the Library, and it was from the 1890s when the library started, okay, that's really nice, that has to be really valuable, something like that. We've got a couple pieces of jewelry. Uh, this piece here I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, Canio. Uh, so it's a, a shell card, so that it's multi-layered. It uh, has nice subject matter, and has two women in an outdoor scene, so again, more complex of a, of a uh, picture that was done. Uh, it's set, it can be either used as a brooch or a pendant, uh, as a little bail to hang on it, so that, again, makes it a little bit more adaptable. Unfortunately, it's set in, in its old fill, uh, the, the frame, if it was set in 14 karat gold or 18 karat gold, that would boost the value. The hardest thing, uh, the biggest problem here is, again, we go back to Victorian furniture that you showed, this is that Victorian era, we're not dressing that way. Uh, so the, the cameo market has, they were hot in the 70s and 80s, and then they, you know, died out. Right. Um, so again, yeah, yeah. we're in that two-star range. Might, I was going to say, we might be two stars. If it were 14 karat gold, we might get up to three stars then, because of the, not because of the cameo, but because of the gold in the setting. So here we have two more, we have two pocket watches, and one is a lady's, one is a man's. Uh, Interesting, uh, one of the two, one we have is an Elgin, uh, and it has a, uh, so we have a little second dial, sometimes we'll have a second hand to set the second dial, and that's in a silveroid case. Then we have the ladies, and this would have been worn around the neck, and important here is, you know, we have a Victorian era, it's called a slide chain, uh, that would adjust with this little slide here. Um, in looking at the case, um, open up the back, look at the case. Some of the things we look at, obviously, is metal. And this case says on it, 20 years warranty. So what that means is it's gold-plated, um, and they're, they're guaranteeing the case will hold up for 20 years. Okay, so when you see that, you, you know it's not a gold case. Yeah, that's real, that means it's not good. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it's good, but it means it's not good. Yeah. Gold would have been warranty forever. Um, the other thing I was looking for is to see how many jewels it had. So that tells me also, you know, the, the quality of the, the movement. Um, again, uh, both collectible. I would say they're uh, both in that red right on that cusp um, of the one to two star range. Okay. Um, now this is different than a G clay. This is a print which means it, uh, it's not an original, it's not a drawing, and it's not a watercolor. It is a multiple image. So the original image that the artist made, um, either he made it on another medium, and then they reproduced it onto the paper here. So the artist here is Antoine uh, Refriger, Refriger, and you have to apologize. Uh, Excuse me for that. So he was born in Russia in 1905, a little bit on the back there. Um, and there's no title to it, but it is signed here on the lower right side. But on the lower left side, we have a series of numbers, 222 slash 275. Now what that tells me is that they made 275 of these, exactly like this. They're number different, one, two, three, four, on up to 275. Now, generally, if I don't know about an artist, the first thing that I do is I go into my computer and do data searches. And I didn't have time to do that, so I don't know on this. But I do know it's a multiple. In other words, it is a limited edition of that many. That tends to tell me, without looking too much further, that I'm not in the five-star category. Usually a multiple is going to be on the lower end right here. Uh, 
and the lower the addition size, the better. So if it were 50 of the addition, then it's going to be worth more than rather if there's 5,000 of a piece. Um, who's the painter of white? Uh, Thomas, Thomas King Cape, right? You can get some of his editions and they were 5,000 and 10,000 in these multiples because he was a really good marketer. Uh, they're not worth that. Uh, and they're not worth anywhere near what people paid for them, but he was a good marketer at his time. So, I can't tell you without looking at this, but this would be pretty easy to find after about 20 minutes worth of uh, searching. And my guess is it's probably going to range anywhere from maybe 200 to, I'm going to guess three star, 200 to 500, but I'm not sure. But I, because you've got the information, it's going to be an easy way to find out. So if you need a little help or want to know what, where to go, ask me later on and I'll tell you. Okay? I'm always happy to tell people where to go. <laughs> Okay, here we have a few things that we have to look here. Here we have some cufflinks. Again, uh, I don't know the mark. It's a turtle mark or something on the back. It, due to the weight, I'm going to say they're not gold. Um, but again, cufflinks have made a, a comeback uh, in, in dress, so they do have some value. But they, again, being not gold and gold plated, uh, they're going to be in that one star category. Uh, two pieces of uh, what appears to be silver, and they look very much alike, don't they, in terms of what they're made out of? This one is silver plate, and this one is sterling. So this one, you got one, you barely reach a one star on that one, and this one, you're maybe one year in the high one star on this one. Uh, this one looks like it's some kind of, it's almost like asparagus tongs or server, some kind of vegetable server, and it is uh, sterling. So it would be a matter, and there is, there is the maker's mark on it, so you can find who made it, you can find the pattern, and then you could actually, you could go to replacement style limited and see what they're asking for something like this, or you could go to the manufacturer, and if you find the, the price new on this, it's probably about $350. The more realistic price used is probably $50. You know, under fifty dollars, but uh, but it's a nice. But that's a, again a classic example. Of if you take this and weigh it, you're an ounce. So you're going to get ninety-two percent of fourteen dollars, which is the silver price, is what they're going to offer. And that's where you look at some of these things and say form and function is more valuable than the. Right. Economics. So you're better off selling that at auction rather than taking it to a scrap person. You get far more at auction. Uh, I'm going to do this doll, not because I know a lot about it, but uh, I thought it was really unusual because it's a Campbell soup can. And so I made a joke and said, I bet you got a Campbell soup doll in there. And sure enough, there's a Campbell soup doll in here. Right there. It's, you see her right there. And uh, this, the paperwork is all here. This was given out as a premium in the 1990s. And there's a history, and it's all written here in terms of the company. There's a family tied to the company, the Campbell Soup Company, and the fact uh, how many of these were made, etc. Now, having said that, I think this is there was what a couple thousand of these made, a couple thousand of those made. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to guess, and I don't, I don't want to hurt your feelings here, but I'm going to guess that in the market today, even with all that paperwork and everything. We're probably in the two-star area right now. We're in that 500 to 200. However, this is something that, in the long term, um, something you give your kids and your grandkids. I would say this is a good possible investment because it's got everything going for it, and because of the number that were made, and there's a good chance that through the years the rest of them will be played with or thrown away or whatever, and there won't be a lot of it. I would probably go to live auctioneers and look this up, and I bet there's not a sale in there. Because it hasn't been long enough for there to have been a track record, but there might be. But, Fred, if you had that, I don't think you get 200, would you? It, it would be hard, even with all that provenance on there. Next piece here, we have a, a little writing instrument, a quill pen. So we have a mother of pearl candle. Uh, the metal is, here's the gold plated, I didn't see any gold marks 
markings on it, but some of them do uh, have 14 karat nibs. So this would have be dipped in the ink for your uh, calligraphy pen. Writing instruments, very collectible, but you, when you get into the fountain pens, so it's that progression. Um, we just sold a, a large collection of fountain pens and have another one coming up. But again, it's that. So you're probably in here, even though the category, category is hot. The category is hot, but the functionality is low on this one. But again, wonderful with the case here and the uh, quality. Probably one, one star. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned advertising signs when we did that King of Russia sign. And here is an advertising sign. It's enamel on metal, Austin service. Now, I wonder if that meant the car. Yes. It did mean the car. Oh, that's why they're there. That makes a difference. I was first thinking Austin might have been the name of a, a garage, the guy's last name, you know, Austin Service. The fact that it's a car has just tripled in my mind what I was probably going to tell you. It's double sided. It's in, I would say, pretty good condition. There's a couple of significant rust spots and wear on it. It, it has no graphic on it, which is too bad. But it's still because of Austin. Uh, and so I am. Yeah. And then I'm going to take a wild guess here and say this is in the hot area. And I'm, I would put it at four stars, the 500 to 2,000. Um, it would be easy to look up, and I'm thinking, I'm, I, I feel comfortable with the range, but I would rather look it up to, to be, you know, help you out a little more. These are some, some of these can be surprising, you know, even those with bullet holes can be surprising. <laughs> so um, it, it depends how many of these are made, and uh, there are books just on this, by the way. Uh, I know the author of a guy that does. Uh, books on service station memorabilia and gas station globes and signs and whatever. And it is amazing the price of some of that stuff, as long as it's original. And that's a nice one. So, sorry, I can't help you more than that. Here again, we have another nice little crossover collectible. So, we have a souvenir uh, from the uh, Louisiana Purchase Monument. And that little souvenir is a match safe. So, you would keep your Wood matches in there and provided a little striker on the bottom. Um, again, widely collectible, uh, especially in various forms. Um, they get it very involved with enamel decoration and figures and uh, other things. The, the is this silver? Silver? This is not silver, and that's, that's another, uh, if it was sterling silver, that would obviously raise value as well. I would say the fact that it's a souvenir is probably on that colder side. Of the of the chart, and uh, you know, although match sheets are collectible, it could be in that one star range. Uh, I'm going to go out and live on this, and I'm just going to say I think it's a souvenir Indian type of map or Indian type of rug. Uh, I don't think it has a lot of age. I don't think it's, I'm, I'm going to simply say, I think it's, now you're in an area, however, that could get hot quick, but I, I think you're in a one-star area. I have appraised these and had people appraise these that have been ten stars. You know, when you, when you get into some of these that are that are made from the original members of tribes. It's a Mexico Indian. New Mexico, New Mexico Indian, yeah. Um, what I would do on this uh, is I would take a photograph and I would send it to a friend of mine in Santa Fe. And that's what all he does all day long. And so he'd be able to tell me what tribe it was, you know, what he thinks the age is and how much it's worth. Again, what I'm telling you from what I got, I think it's on the lower end because it's so small and it doesn't have. The, the graphic doesn't grab me like the red, the reds, the whites, the black triangle, or diamond crystals. And they seem to like that. So, there you go. Might have to do a little more work. So the next piece we have here is a uh, local pottery. It's redware and mug. Uh, it does have a little condition issue on the bottom, but it's inscribed on the bottom. 
made by Stahl's Pottery by Thomas Stahl, July 21st, 1986. So the Stahl family was Isaac, Russell, and Thomas. Um, and um, again, you know, glaze color goes into importance, uh, form goes into importance, but more importantly, with, with tackling with the stalls, again, 20 years ago, people knew the stalls, they were relating to the stall family. Uh, now people are relating to Lester Briner, who uh, was a, a Robisonia potter, and they were relating to the stories and, and uh, the Turtle Creeks and things like that, where people are, are talking to the potters and getting the story. The other thing the stall pottery was noted for was they would oftentimes put a, a weather report on the bottom. You know, if it was cloudy or if it was raining that day, they would inscribe that, and that was their trademark. Uh, that on the bottom. Today, I would say this is a market that is is poor, uh, you know, but uh, the, the form and function and condition is the hurt on this one, so you're one star. I learned something new every day. See, I never do all that stuff. Amazing. I, I didn't even want to attempt this. Well, I didn't either. <laughs> you were pushing them down the table, I saw that. Um, I, uh, but I will say this, this, and the reason I hesitate is, again, when we talk about uh, at, our, at our facility, we have a couple guys in their 30s, and they always say, I'm not geek enough for, for these things, because this was never my thing, you know, the Star Wars. But I have, you know, this is Star Trek, Star Wars. I have sold at auction um, Star Wars in the blister pack, uh, the figures. For four, five, six thousand dollars. Now, the other complicator to that is they were owned by Leonardo DiCaprio, it was his collection, so that was another contributing factor. But Star Wars, Star Trek, and the fact that they're in their original packaging uh, does, you know, bode well. And uh, again, I don't know the importance of you know who they are and all that. This is really funny because we're too old to be able to tell me all this. I just, I, again, I feel the same way, is that, you know, my kids, I took my kids to Star Wars and we bought them Star Wars stuff and, and the same to Star Trek, the original, of course, and this is not the original. Uh, okay, I knew the original, but this is later on. I don't know. But again, the original box, but yeah. a little beat up, you know, so that's all going to be part of the factors in value too. Here's where I would go for something like this. I wouldn't go to live auctioneers, but I would go to eBay. I mean, eBay, now I'm going to give you a little hint here. When you go to eBay, you type it in and everything comes up under that search. Okay, that's fine, but that information is worthless. What you want to do then is there is on the right hand side, it says advanced search. You check that little box and then another screen comes up and you're able to go down and click an area that says completed sales. You don't want what somebody's asking. You want to see something that actually sold. So then the other screen comes up with the, all the sales in the past 30 days of that particular item. Then you get real good information. That's what I would do with that. I, is I would see what people are asking for these and I'd see what they sold for. And that's going to give you a really good idea. Yes? Well, they're mine. I feel real good that I stopped. <laughs> well, well, let's just well, let, we'll, we'll just well, cast it starts here, out right? one star and goes up, right? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say right now I would imagine there are two stars. That's gonna, but again, it's strictly a guess. I don't know. Yeah, well, that's good. I feel good. Good. So here we have a little uh, folding pocket camera. It's a Kodak. Um, again. They were, they were mass produced, they are collectible. Uh, what adds to collectability on these cameras is when you get into colored bellows. So there's green bellows, red bellows, blue bellows, and that adds a few more ticks on that, that collectability. Again, decorative, collectible, um, you know, photography, because of the evolution of and everything going digital, I'm seeing a lot of the early American photography indoor subjects. Those markets are going up, um, but still kind of in that, uh, this is still in that one star range as far as back. Sure. I mean, it, it's not rare, so I don't know that anybody would, would care or know. Most people are going to buy that.
create a little vignette because you're a photographer and it's a, something of interest, etc. Uh, three piece tea, tea set here. When I see this, when I saw this from over here, I thought, oh, that's Picard. I thought too. I thought it was Picard China, which was a company that has a they put gold on their porcelain. And I pick it up and look at the bottom, and it is, and it says RS Germany, which was what the Rudolf Schlegelmilch company or something in Germany. Originally, it was from Prussia, so you have RS Prussia, and then you have RS Germany, which is the same company. It's just a later version of it. That's kind of unusual and neat to have that, and it has kind of a mid-century modern look to it, doesn't it? But RS Germany isn't in the 1950s or 60s, so that's kind of like avant-garde at the time. I kind of like that, and, and although if anyone else brought a tea set tonight, I would almost guarantee that I would say it's cold and it's one star. I like this, and I'm going to say yes. Do so you have more to it? So you actually have a tea set. That's even better. So I'm, I'm going to put it up in here, and I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to go to at least two stars on that. Now, RS Germany and RS Prussia is not as hot as it once was. In the 1960s and 70s, this was real hot. People would, would just go ape over that stuff. It's calmed down a lot, but I kind of like the look on this. So. It was in the 1960s. 1940s, no. Good? Okay. Good. So next up, we have a little mantle clock here. It's made by the Seth Thomas Company. Um, it is a eight-day movement from time and strike, so it has a little uh, gong in the back. The case is uh, faux painted. Uh, it's wood, but it's painted to look like marble. Uh, again, collectible, not valuable. Um, again, as I mentioned before, the clock market, um, when you get into complications, uh, moon phases, open escapements where you can see the gears moving, um, when you get into calendars and things like that, or more elaborate cases, that's when your value goes up. Um, the one thing I will say to whoever brought this, before you take it home, let me take the pendulum off. Uh, when you move a clock, don't move with the pendulum. That uh, it can be what happens and snaps your spring uh, on the clock, or else the suspension spring. So we'll just take that off. I was saying in general, most clocks are in the in the bottom area. They're not in the very high area. Even grandfather clocks. Because the clocks are here now. Yeah. You know, they're, your clock is on your VCR. It's on your microwave. It's on your telephone. It's everywhere else. You know. So we're just kind of going away. Now here's a suggestion. Like if you have mantle clocks that need care, are you allowed to Sure. You can call us up. Yeah. We probably have different guys. I have a guy in Mansdale I use. Okay. Probably the same guy, right? Okay. Yeah. But we just can't remember his name, but he's in Lansdale. Well, he just, no, he just, the one I'm referring to, he's got there. What's the point shit? No, we've got two guys in Mansdale. <laughs> Mansdale's a clock center now. But there's, I mean, there's quite a few people yeah. around. Um, that I used to use Guy in Phoenixville. Yeah. He's no longer here. That's so. what I you used him too, yeah. right? <laughs> um, we only have a couple minutes, so what we're going to do now is we're just going to do the chart on these next things. Can we do that, Brad? Sure. Uh, are they? What do you get? I picked that up, but I wasn't sure, so I figured I'd let Brad. But I'm going to say, to me, sort of arts and crafts with some rabbits and uh, some other symbols, maybe Persian. I was going to say it's either Persian or it's arts and crafts. Yeah. If it were arts and crafts, it would be better. Yeah. Uh, even if it's Persian and 200 years earlier, it still would have been better to have been arts and crafts in America. So we're going to put it one star, maybe upper one star. Silhouettes, right? Silhouettes. Is it of George and Mary or just George and Martha? George and Martha. It's Abraham. Looks like Abraham Lincoln there. Abraham and Martha, what were they doing together? <laughs> we got a story now. I don't think they're anybody. <laughs> So the Mary Todd, yeah, there we go. Okay. Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln. There you go. Um, but I'm going to guess it's one star in, in the $50 range. In silhouettes, you're looking for the early columns. Early columns. But even there, it's 
Mark. Yeah, eight there, Mark. Ten. These look like this, but they're porcelain. Yeah, they are porcelain. Ooh. And B and G. B and G, they're Danish. So we're going to do, Danish is, well, I'm going to put it right here in the middle. Some of it's, because the B and G also made Christmas plates. But some of the stuff they made is really popular. Oh, we have some condition issues. So uh, we have a replaced spear and a chip on the head. That's so too bad. And we're at the one star. Although some B and G knew for insurance coverage, you're going to be in two or three star for that. Silver plated label. Silver plated label. It's got three little marks on it, but they're not silver marks. So we're down to one star, and we're down to kind of. And you, I can't tell you how many of these labels I've seen just like that with those marks on it. Almost looks Chinese, but I don't think so. Um, yeah, not sure. Either. If that were Chinese, it would be better than if it were American, probably.
So it's Joseph Pinnell, um, and he did a lot of the Philadelphia scenes in and around town. Um, he did uh, drawings, etchings, engravings, uh, again, collectible. Um, and when we talk about one of those uh, artists that does multiples, um, you know, but there, there were series and things that he did, and even though it's a multiple, it would still have value. And I would say, and you're probably looking in the two to four hundred dollar range. So yeah, good. Yeah. So we're in a three star range, and we're in an area that's pretty good right there. So I think that covered everything. Did we miss something? What did we miss? The little had white with a glass necklace. Is that glass? Is that like